Okay, this is an impromptu uh, premiere, um, and I say impromptu because I literally just decided to do it when I got done uh, doing the critical motor work on this particular machine you see in front of you right now, which is none other than a Singer 101-4 that belongs to uh, Chris, and uh, Chris is from uh, Eden, New York, if you're not familiar with uh, this machine or haven't seen it before for whatever reason I, I have done a number of posts on Facebook that I will share with you through this venue because I know a number of you youtubers do not do Facebook and that's uh, that's totally cool I get it but uh, this particular machine let's just say it had a lot of challenges and so I'm gonna I think what I'll do is I was gonna do it in a different order but I'm gonna take you over to Facebook real quick first and uh, take you through um, some of the shots where I show kind of uh, the innards of the machine and just kind of give you an impression of what condition is this machine when it arrived uh, before the work began. Now, if you look at this machine from the outside, kind of like a lot of people will make their buying decisions. They'll go to eBay, they'll go to Etsy, they'll go to Bonanza, they'll go to wherever they're going to go, maybe Pinterest. And they'll see a machine and on the outside, it looks fabulous. And so they'll buy that machine. And then all of a sudden they get it home and they start to experience problems. Maybe the thing starts smoking. Who knows? Maybe it won't run. Maybe it won't stitch worth a darn. You can't judge a machine by the outside. You know, back to that old, old adage of long ago, you can't judge a book by its cover. Uh, you've got to be wiser than that. And if you watch this channel a lot, you're already wise because this is a classroom and we share knowledge back and forth all the time. And uh, I learn many, many things from all of you uh, around the world. And hopefully you learn a fair amount from me as well through these uh, premieres and through these videos that I've shared for quite a while, <laughs> quite a while. But uh, from the outside, as you look at this machine that came to us again from Chris out in Eden, New York, it's not a bad looking machine. Now, Chris hates the base, but just ignore the base. The machine alone on the outside, hey, it's not bad looking at all. But as we start to dig into this machine, as I do at a surgical level, all of a sudden, bells and whistles start going off. I think you'll see what I'm talking about in a little bit. Some of these other pictures still are kind of wooing us into a sense of, oh, look at the pretty faceplate. Isn't it a lovely face faceplate? I think I'm going to buy this machine. I don't know whose voice that was. I'll just blame it on Mr. Bean. Mr. Bean was playing one of his odd characters. So again, you're looking at this machine and you're like, hey, this is not bad. Hey, baby, it's pretty, uh, pretty uh, nice looking machine. But we keep moving forward at a very intelligent level because that's the way we operate on this channel. And all of a sudden we start digging into the machine and deferred maintenance cries out with a loud voice saying, I haven't been clean probably for at least 20 to 30 years. I have no idea whose voice that was either. But you can just kind of look in some of the telltale signs. When you look at rust on the presser foot and on the needle bar, and you look at all the, the junk amunk uh, down in the raceway area, uh, it right away tells a tale of, okay, maybe I need to look deeper than the cover of this book. Maybe deeper than the cover of the book. And this is still not a major showstopper, but you're looking at uh, the veneering and uh, uh, all the caramelized junk on the paint, which pretty much tells you that the machine has not been maintained in a persnickety way. I've gotten a lot of compliments on that word persnickety, so I'm going to keep on using it. And there's our stitch length, and not a major showstopper, nothing like, oh my gosh, look at the smoking gun. But if you look at the lower edge below where you would turn the dial, you can see all the junk on there, all the caramelized oil, the varnishing. And again, it just tells you a story of a machine that has not been maintained at a high level. 
And again, we're just continuing to let me change my camera shot here. We're just continuing to work our way around the machine. That's the way I do it. Uh, I'm not going to take anything at face value. I want to look at all angles of the machine. Uh, really start to see what we can see to give us an impression of that machine. And again, what I'm seeing so far is I'm seeing a machine that has a lot of uh, maintenance as far as cleaning and maintaining the machine uh, has been deferred. It's been deferred and it's, it's been neglected to some degree. Just another shot of the machine kind of from the top down. And again, even the top of the machine, which sometimes isn't quite as bad, uh, also shows sign of varnishing and caramelized oil and just general neglect. But none of this stuff is shocking so far. None of this, none of this is shocking. So now we're looking at the side of the balance wheel. Nothing shocking again. You're looking at the clutch and yeah, the clutch is a little bit uh, junked up. It's got some uh, rust on it and it's just looking uh, again like um, somebody decided to go fishing that had this machine before Chris and said, eh, I'll clean it tomorrow. Eh, I'll clean it the next day. Oh, I'll do some cleaning on it after I get done fishing again. So again, just yucky looking, luck, yucky looking machine. Now we're looking at the rear of the machine uh, adjacent to the balance wheel. And again, a combination of dirt, varnishing, and even a little bit of a uh, little bit of rust intermingled, um, kind of just in between the cracks and crevices. But again, nothing shocking yet. Nothing like whoa, whoa, what's going on? So now we're looking at the rear, rear of the potted motor. And uh, again, if you're not familiar with the Singer 101-4 or the 101 in general. Uh, it did precede, obviously, the Singer 201-2 uh, by quite a few years, by like 15 years. Uh, it came on the scene in around 1920, and the 201 didn't come on the scene until around 1935. So uh, this machine was out there for quite a while um, and kind of fell off the charts for a couple of years uh, in, in manufacturing at least before the 201-2 was finally revealed in the mid-1930s. So again, nothing shocking. We're looking at the rear of the motor now. It kind of looks, okay, it's a motor, whatever. Whatever. Now we're starting to get a little bit closer in and we're looking at the uh, wire wraps and we're looking at the, uh, the motor assembly in the center a little bit. And again, we're seeing some neglect. That should be a nice golden brown, kind of more of a golden style color. And it's not looking like that. But again, nothing shocking. Nothing like, whoa, what's going on? And you'll notice that most of the, let's just say the 201-2s or the 1591s, when you take off that motor cover on the potted motor and you look at that nomenclature plate, you're going to see a lot of those motors that are rated at 0.5 amps. you notice this one is rated at 0.6 amps. And there are some 201-2s that are rated at 0.6 as well, but Singer kind of went back and forth on that. So what I'm showing you there, again, nothing, whoa, crazy. Inside of that cover, I'm seeing little remnants of parts of the flex of inside of the motor sticking to the inside of that cover which to you, you might look at that and go, oh, it's dirt. To me, that's a red flag that there are some motor issues that I'm gonna be revealing or digging into uh, and showing on, on camera in, in a bit. And that, that hunch, that experience uh, proves to be true. You'll see shortly. So now we are starting to rip that motor apart a little bit. And you can see by my uh, what is that? What digit of that is mine? Is that my thumb? You can see by my thumb that dirt that I was talking about is now becoming more and more uh, evident as far as the motor on this 101-4. But that's that's nothing. That's nothing. That's, that's child's play. 
we're going to really, really reveal that you should never, ever, ever judge a book by its cover. Those initial shots of Chris's 101-4, and you looked at it from the outside, and you looked at the pretty face play, and you were like, oh, this is a pretty pretty nice machine. This, this is a nice one. As you start to dig into a machine at a surgical level, all of a sudden that beauty starts to fade. And it's already starting to fade right now with what you're seeing on camera, but it's going to get ugly in a little bit here. It's going to get ugly. And the ugliness is starting to be revealed as we look at the rear of this potted motor. Almost looks like somebody tried to make cupcakes, doesn't it? Yeah. And what were you saying about a pretty machine? What were you saying? About, I, I, I missed that. Could you, could you say that one more time? That is probably one of the worst motors as far as maintenance neglect that I've ever seen. It's right at the, I mean, if it's not at the top of the, it's near the, it's at the top of the list. Yeah, it's definitely at the top of the list. And if you do Facebook, you've already seen these. These were posted on Facebook. And, and this area right here, you can't see it judging it by the depth of the photo. It's a, it's a one-dimensional photo. But the, the junk and the buildup around here where this worm gear is in the middle is probably about five to six millimeters deep. Five to six millimeters deep. Yeah, yuck. This is part of that same assembly there and you can just see the junk and gunk uh, built up on it. And this is no fault of Chris out in uh, the great state of New York, uh, Eden, New York to be specific, because when he bought this machine, he didn't have access to being able to look at the machine at this depth. Not to mention the owner that sold it to him probably if they knew. I don't have photos like that available. That would probably be their answer. Because if Chris had seen this, he probably would have thought twice or three times about uh, purchasing this machine. And there you can see the inner worm gears that drive the main shaft are also just caked and crusted with so much buildup. They're, they're barely, I mean, when I tried to turn the balance wheel, they're ba barely able to even turn over. And a machine should never reach this stage of neglect, in my opinion, in my opinion. We're back to the bed again, big deal. We want to see more shots of the motor, preferably the motor on fire if possible. That would be a really cool, interesting thing. Joking, Chris, joking. So now we're looking at the area. Uh, we've taken off the cover of the machine and we've taken off the uh, feed dog cover as well, the needle plate. And we're able to see again, just signs of uh, evident uh, neglect a little bit of lint in the uh, feed dog area is pretty common, but that's not just lint, folks. That's grit and grime and all kinds of other nasty stuff, like you'd find in the bottom of a bathtub that was never cleaned. So, uh, you know, once again, I'm used to seeing dirty machines. I've been doing this for a long time. But a machine at this level of neglect... Um, when you have buildup like this, like you saw in those inner worm gears in the rear of the machine, you have buildup like this, and it's all the same kind of buildup in between. It stresses that motor to a point of literally killing the motor, which is what happened in Chris's uh, case. Even after I made intervention, and um, I'm not going to necessarily show those shots. They are up on Facebook. Uh, but even after I made in intervention and tried to do a bath to... Uh, debris and to clean and to purge that motor of all the probably decades of junk. This particular machine is from the 1930s. Uh, it wasn't enough to save that motor. Some motors are just, they're, they're neglected to such an extent and they're operated while they're being neglected and while they're dealing with all, you know, trying to turn a main shaft and everything else with all of that crud built up on there 
causing incredible drag on that motor and it just kills the motor. It would be like uh, driving a car without ever changing the oil, uh, without ever uh, doing basic maintenance on the car to address those areas of lubrication that are so critical. So here what I'm doing is I'm I'm cleaning out a screw. This particular model, the 101-4, the bed plate itself can actually be taken off in its entirety. And there's a series of screws that hold that in place. And so this even here is so crudded up that I wasn't able to get a screwdriver in. And you, and you never want to try to put a screwdriver into a screw if it's all crudded up because in all likelihood you're going to be forcing that screwdriver in and it's either going to skip off and uh, cause damage to the bed or it's going to skip off and uh, crack the screw and then you'll have to drill it out. So taking a little bit of time to clean that groove out to get a nice uh, uh, clear track to put that screwdriver into is well worth, well worth the time. So at this point I've gotten that bed cover off and you can start to see holy mackerel. You can see the whole innards of that. And what are these weird little things over here? What's that about? Is that a spider? I don't think so. Uh, that's part of the wicking system on this 101-4. And their philosophy back in the 20s was people like sewing machines, but they don't like maintaining sewing machines and doing maintenance on them. So we're going to develop a wicking system where we're going to have a little cup basically that you can lubricate with that with the cover on. Imagine that that cover is back on there again. There's going to be some little holes just to the left of the raceway where you can drop oil down. Approximately 10 to 12 drops of oil every time you use the machine. I would say, you know, re realistically about 8 to 10 hours of sewing you want to put about a dozen drops of oil in that little hole that goes through that plate. And I'll show you the plate here, just so you can, you're going, what the heck's he talking about? And I don't have the camera turned around, so I can't see what you're seeing. But you see this little point right here? Right in that hole right there is where you're going to be putting that oil when this cover is on. Again, about 10 to 12 drops. And it's going to drop down into a little cup, which I think will be visible. I think it'll be visible. Uh, in one of these shots, and it's just to the left there. Uh, and then that oil basically gets sucked up by these little octopus arms. We'll just call it a wicking, the wicking arms. And you can see how they jut out to all the main pivot points. So that oil works its way from the little cup that you can't really see well there. Well, you sort of can, right there. See it right there? That's what, whoa, crash and burn, buddy, crash and burn. So, so that little cup right there is where that oil, when you drop it through that cover, it's going to go into that cup, and then it's going to wick out through all of those little arms, and it's going to uh, lubricate, supposedly, all of those critical pivot points. But what about a pivot point right there, where that's going to be agitating back and forth? What about that pivot point? It just wasn't a perfect science. It missed a lot of the critical spots that when I got this cover off, I right away went to town in lubricating those pivot points uh, to make sure that there was no resistance on that motor uh, once I uh, was able to start to bring the machine back to life. So you may not be able to see it in the shot, but that's the main shaft coming from left to right there to, towards the raceway. Uh, and it's going to basically allow that needle to be moving up and down. It's going to be, it's going to be driving a lot of the functions of that raceway. And you'll see a second shaft also to the foreground, the, uh, just barely out of view. It's going to be right there. So that main shaft is going to be really critical in driving a lot of the functions uh, that make this machine operate. And again, you just kind of look to the left, just below the pillar, pillar there, you can see 
Um, they're not just dust bunnies. There's just all kinds of junk in there. So here you're kind of looking at that open cavity there where that motor is supposed to be. And um, I'm not sure in this shot. I don't think I show it. Oh, and also near that worm gear that's supposed to be turning that comes up against the bottom of the main track of gears that you saw that were all gunked up. There's needles and all kinds of other things. That's what I'm holding in my fingers. Needles and other debris that are getting in there inhibiting that motor from turning along with all the other crazy stuff that's in the way. And what I'm showing you there is on this particular 101 that belongs to Chris, they make it really easy to know when that machine was born. You can see me shining light on it right there, uh, that where it's stamped right into the metal. And it tells you that Chris's machine was born on October 3rd, 1930. October 3rd, 1930. So about 10 years after the 101s came onto the scene, approximately a decade after the 101s came onto the scene in 1920, Chris's machine was born. And the 101s do not, wouldn't it be great, wouldn't it be wonderful if every single 101 was stamped in exactly the same spot so you could date the machine fairly easily? Uh, that's not the case. I can show you a 101 from my personal collection. You might be able to see it in the shot. I'm going to turn my screen around so I can hopefully show it to you on screen. This is my 101. And you can see even the bottom. I'm going to come out on this shot a little bit. Whoops. You can see even the bottom on this one is different. It's got like a cavity. It looks like you could put a, a cell phone in there or something like that. And uh, Chris's machine looks totally different than that on the base. And then if we continue to turn it around, it's going to be really hard to see. But right, and this thing is not light, by the way. <laughs> right here, where my thumb is, I don't know if you can see that or not. I, I don't have the best angle here. There's a plate, and it's stamped with the serial number. And you can see the proximity of it towards the bottom of the machine. It's just going to be basically right underneath where the bobbin winder would be. See the bobbin winder right there and then see where my thumb is? That's where this serial number is. And it probably, you can't probably read it very well on camera, but it's AA501373 is what this particular plate shows. I think you can almost see it there. Yeah. So, it just goes back to the inconsistency or the, the, the difficulty in sometimes when machine manufacturers decide to take different tracks in how they're uh, marking their machines uh, for that owner to be able to figure out, you know, well, I wonder when my machine was born. Well, if they had done them all like this, that's pretty daggone easy. That's pretty daggone easy. Is that the last? Oh, that's the last photo. That's why it's saying, hey, well, I can't help you no more. I'm sorry, very much sorry to you. So, it gives you an idea again. I just want to emphasize, if you decide to buy a machine from Goodwill Online, eBay, Etsy, Bonanza, you can name off all the other venues where you might be able to get them. Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace. Do not be naive in thinking that because the machine, <clears throat> excuse me, yuck. Yuck, yuck! It's like a Stephen King movie with a sewing machine. Hey, that's an idea. We should do that. <clears throat> so don't be deceived. If you are looking at a machine at one of those venues and it looks like this, 
realize that that's the cover of the book. Realize that this is the cover of the book. And then remember this premiere where I showed you what's inside of that book when you start to dig into it. And then you might want to consider, you might want to consider the idea of instead of buying a machine in one of those venues, reaching out to me and saying, all right, I get it. I get it. I don't want to buy a bad book. <laughs> I want you to find me the best machine possible, Scott, and prepare it for me, please. And I know I'm going to get quality. I'm not going to get a machine like this that looks great on the outside, and then all of a sudden, I, you know, I start to experience problems. I send it to you, and then you do a premiere like this showing what I missed reasonably because it looked that doggone good on the outside. You know what I mean? It looked that doggone good on the inside. So, buyer beware. That's what I'll say. What am I doing here? Oh, I know what I was going to do. I was just going to show you real quick. I do this periodically just for fun. Just for fun. Periodically for fun, we like to look and see where are people watching this YouTube channel? And they rank them in the number of views and the length of duration of how many videos are being viewed within that particular country. So at the top, no surprise, no shocker, is the United States. And then right after that are my friends over in Mr. Bean country. I'll just say that. And I, don't, I don't think the folks in the United King Kingdom take any offense to that at all. I think they love Mr. Bean. I, I hope they do. So the United Kingdom is in position two. And then we have our friends to the north up in Canada. I'm trying to make this move. And then after Canada, we have Sweden. And uh, I'm trying to see the camera as well. Yep, Sweden. And uh, Mexico. India. Germany, and again, these are the countries that are ranked highest, the most number of views, the most longest viewership, and all that kind of stuff. We have Germany, Australia, Australia Italy, Colombia, the Netherlands, Brazil, Boy, I'm just going, I'm going crazy here. I'm getting ahead of myself. What the heck? So back to Brazil. Argentina. Norway, where uh, Hans Christian is from. The Philippines. France. Where is my camera angle? I am just totally out of sink here. Get, get, bear, bear with me for a second, folks. There we go. Let's go up to the top. That, that'll probably be a little bit easier. So France, and then it might be a little bit surprising, but then all of a sudden we have Vietnam pop up. Vietnam, there's a lot of viewership in uh, Vietnam. Whoops. And we have Turkey and uh, Finland. Uh, Algeria, South Africa, Chile, Pakistan, blah, Peru, Venezuela, Iraq, Morocco. Those things just don't line up right. Spain. Switzerland. Denmark. I'm just going to go like this. Denmark. Russia. Thailand. Poland. 
Belgium, Estonia, Nigeria, Ghana, Puerto Rico, Ecuador, Saudi Arabia, Barbados, Kenya, Nam Nambia, Bangladesh, I think now I, I have to move the camera because you're saying, well, I don't even see that. Kenya, Nam, Nam, Namibia, I'm totally killing that, sorry. Bangladesh, Bolivia, Bere, Boreas, Japan, boy, Japan is way down there, aren't they? Come on, guys, in Japan. Romania, Croatia, and last but not least, at the very bottom with the lowest viewership, but enough viewership to fall on the radar for YouTube, uh, is the great country of Hungary. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I thought that was kind of cool. And I show this periodically just because it's interesting to folks, I think. What about viewer age? Viewer age may be another area that you're kind of curious about. Or maybe you're not curious about it, but I am. So viewership, 18 to 17 year olds, about 6.2% of the viewership population. 18 to 24 year olds, almost 6%. Wait a second, I got the crummiest reading glasses ever. What am I saying 6%? 16%. I've got to get new glasses, folks, I really do. This is horrible. The age bracket of 25 to 34, what is that, the third one down, you just have to kind of see, because I'm looking at this little screen in order to, and we're looking at about 18.8, maybe I can come out, can I come out and can we see all that, so I don't have to go back and forth, because I'm going to go blind or I'm going to drive you crazy, one of the two, let's do that, let's just leave it like that, stay, okay, so where was I, um, 18 to 24 year olds, 6.2%, uh, 25 to 34 year olds, 15.9%, uh, 35 to 44 year olds, 18.8%, 45 to 54 year olds, 20.4%, 55 to 64 year olds, 21.5%, and then finally 65 plus, we've got 17.3%, of uh, people that will view this channel most frequently. So our biggest group, just barely, our biggest group is the 55 to 64 year olds. And then right behind it is the uh, 45 to 54 year olds. So we're basically saying between, between 45 and 64 is our largest viewing groups uh, for um, uh, vintage sewing machines on cow country vintage sewing uh, machines and restoration. But you know what? Don't be deceived by that because just uh, behind it, behind those two groups, again, the groups of 45 to 54 year olds and 55 to 64 year olds, we've got the third largest group, which is going to be 35 to 44 year olds. 35 to 44 year olds is our third largest group on this channel. So. We've got a wide spectrum of viewership all the way down to 18 year olds uh, watching this channel from 18 year olds up to about, well, who knows? It just says 65 plus. So uh, who knows? Maybe we have folks in their 80s, 90s, 100s that are uh, watching this uh, YouTube channel regularly. And then for a while I was giving the ladies kind of a, a call to action kind of challenging them and saying, why Why is like close to 70% of my viewership all men and you ladies are, are the minority viewership? Because I get so many great interactions with ladies on the channel and on Facebook as well. I was almost shocked when I looked at, looked at the analytics and they were only about 30% of the population viewership on YouTube. Well, guess what? They accepted that call to action. When you challenge a lady uh, especially the ladies from the south they're like yeah I'm gonna give you some of that mm-hmm because they really stepped up 
and uh, all of a sudden, if I go to viewership by gender, where am I? On the left, the green are the men. On the right are the ladies. And uh, you're looking at uh, the, the men probably representing, what is it, about... Uh, let me scroll this up just a little hair here. Or can I mouse over it? Will they actually tell me so that it's really easy? No, they won't do that. They're going to make me work. So the men are right around 50... 55%, something like that. And the ladies have gone all the way up to almost 45%. So they are right on nipping at the heels. Oh, it's down below there. That makes it easier. So the ladies are 47%. The men are 53%, according to this, as far as the overall views. So the ladies are even closer than I thought. Yeah, they're only, uh, I mean, 47%. Versus 53, you can do the math. That's about, six, what, 6%, right? So the disparity is only 6% now, if I kind of zoom in on this. 6% versus before, it was like 35 to 40%. So the ladies have, I mean, kudos to the ladies. They have just stepped it up, and they, I know a number of them are actively engaged in sharing the Facebook page for Cow Country. They're actively engaged in pointing people to the YouTube channel. And you know what? That is that is paying dividends because look at the uh, matchup now. The ladies are only 6% behind the guys. And they're probably going to pass them if they keep at this rate. So uh, I just think this is the analytics are kind of cool. Uh, it's, it's nice to know uh, that we have such a wide span of uh, viewership uh, on so many countries. And again... We don't just have 50 countries watching this YouTube channel. We have probably almost two and a half to three times that number of countries. But YouTube, to save money, because it costs money, apparently, to track analytics, uh, they're only tracking 50 countries now for uh, YouTube creators. So uh, it is what it is. But again, these, this area here, you remember what it looked like in the pictures? I'm already starting to make a huge dent in uh, getting this machine back to a point where it's going to be able to operate properly. And uh, again, not, not trusting this wicking system entirely, but also lubricating all the different points as well. So you saw what that motor looked like, right? You saw what that motor looked like. Let's kind of get a shot right about there. And I don't have this... Uh, machine wired up yet i've got i've got the motor wired up but it's just to a basically a raw lead it's basically to a raw lead it doesn't have any foot controller or anything like that so what i do then is i use these wonderful alligator clips i think that's what most people call them these wonderful alligator clips and then i will direct wire to these bare leads i'll direct wire to these bare leads and obviously keep them apart kind of like when you're jumping a car in a cold climate you never want these to touch when they're energized or it creates all kinds of interesting fourth of july experiences so i always connect the alligator clips first and uh keep them wide apart wide apart and you can see uh the distance you better pay attention because the distance the distance is not great between this and this so I always keep my kind of my thumb kind of in the middle and make sure that they keep their distance from each other. Keep their distance from each other. Now what I want to show you is we have miracles in this workshop every day. I've said that before. If you follow me faithfully, you know that I've said that again and again and again and again and again. And you saw what that motor looked like, right? Well, let me show you what happens with a lot of determination knowledge and persistence persistence first of all I think I will show you without the clutch engaged and we're just going to be focusing on that balance wheel that is if I can turn the screen around and see what you're seeing yeah I'd say that's probably 
close enough. Yeah, let's go like that. That's good. I think that's good. Yeah, let's just leave it like that. Or I'm going to run out of room on my camera probably. Ah! Okay. So what you're going to see first is you're going to see the uh, motor spin up. And you're going to see the balance wheel hopefully turning if I've done a good job. And if I lose my focus and I touch those contacts, then you'll see me jump, which is also fun. Okay, so here we go. <gasps> Motion. Motion. I love it. And now I'm going to widen the shot. Come over here. And lock it in place. And I'm going to temporarily disconnect the power. So that I don't blow myself up. Now I'm engaging the clutch. So we're going to put a load we're going to put a load on this machine. You remember all the junk that was on all of those pivot points, including the worm gears that were kind of centered right behind the motor in here and the housing? They were just totally junked up. This whole area was junked up. And now we're going to see if we have enough power in this motor as it is right now. And I'm still, still going to do a couple of more things to this motor and certainly the rest of the pivot points as well. But if we can get some locomotion of this machine, that is a huge ray of hope. At least it is to me. And that's what a working 101-4 is supposed to look like. Kind of cool, huh? So, this was just a quick little impromptu premiere to show you some progress on Chris's 101-4, which is encouraging. But we're not done yet. We got a long way. We got a long way to go. But you know what? It's like a journey. We've taken a lot of steps already. A lot of steps already. And uh, this is encouraging to me. I know it'll be encouraging to Chris as well. Uh, he was shocked when I posted those pictures on Facebook and I showed just the filth and the grime and the condition of the motor and everything. He was like, I had no idea. How would he? And that again goes back to, you know, if you want to roll the dice, roll the dice. It's your choice. You're in charge. But if you don't want to roll the dice and you want to invest just a little bit more, let me do the work to find you a machine that is going to be in a, in a state that inside and out is going to be a workable solution. And then I can put my magic into it and get that machine just dancing for you. So by the time you get it, it's gone through uh, a very detailed process from, from Bob and the balance wheel. And it's ready to serve you for a lifetime just like this 101-4 will be when I get done with it for uh, Chris out in uh, New York. All right, well, stay tuned for other great uh, premieres like this, sometimes just off-the-cuff impromptu premieres where we cover a lot of things. I mean, everything from <laughs> analytics to, oh, my gosh, I can't believe how filthy and disgusting and what's living inside of that sewing machine because the outside of that book sure looks great to a point of doing a live test on a motor that has been brought back from the dead and just showing you what it's capable of doing. And I do have a backup motor as well. Whichever motor I can get more output of uh, is the one that's going to ultimately be in Chris's machine. I'm going to give him the cream of the crop. So it's either going to be 
uh, this motor that you're looking at right now, or it's going to be, I don't have my screen turned around, it's possibly going to be this motor. So we'll see which, which motor I can get more output out of, uh, and then that motor will be the one that stays with this machine and goes with this machine when it heads back to uh, New York to join Chris. All right, hope you enjoyed this. Hope you found it interesting. Many of you probably have never seen the uh, innards of a 101 operating like I just showed you uh, with a motor that's basically been resurrected. Uh, so I think that in and of itself is cool. Again, this is not a perfect science, this, uh, this uh, wicking system that they came up with. It really does miss a lot of the key lubrication points. And so if you happen to own a 101, uh, whether it's a Dash 4 or otherwise, uh, do not be deceived in thinking that that, okay, I've, I'm going to put those 12 drops of oil, like I heard Scott mention, through that little hole so it goes into that little cup, that little cup that is right here. And that's going to be sufficient to make my machine uh, run at a reasonably optimal level. There are so many pivot points that this wicking system misses so many pivot points uh, that I would strongly encourage you uh, to service those pivot points yourself. And again, the way you can identify them, you don't have to have a book. You can just, uh, you know, turn that balance wheel by hand very slowly. Anything that moves left and right or up and down is fair game for a drop or two of some good machine oil. And again, I do not recommend the three-in-one stuff and some of that other stuff that's out there. Uh, it really acts as a magnet uh, for pulling in dirt and grime and, and, and junk. And who knows, maybe the previous owner before Chris used some sort of lubricant like that on the machine. And that's why the buildup was so ridiculously excessive on that motor uh, and the other components as well uh, that are adjacent to the motor. Uh, remember again, I, I described the motor as a vacuum cleaner. When that motor is running, it's going to be sucking everything in the environment towards that motor. So uh, just be careful what you use on your machine and don't be uh, tricked into using something other than standard machine oil. It really is the best solution uh, when you're uh, looking to optimize and have a machine run well. And again, the whole idea of lubricating all of those pivot points, even beyond what that wicking system does, is it reduces the drag and it takes the strain off of that motor that was just incredibly neglected. Uh, so you, you want to make it easier on that motor so that it doesn't have to work as hard to, uh, to get the job done. And if you're saying, doesn't this machine come with a light? Uh, yeah, it does. But the light that was on Chris's machine, as you may have seen in some other Facebook posts that I put up, uh, had a number of uh, grounding out points in the wiring where the wiring had broken down and it was basically, uh, it was shorting out uh, on itself. Sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't. Sometimes you would jiggle the, the wire and it would go off and then it would go on. And so I'm going to run a totally new wire uh, for that light. Uh, so that Chris has a reliable lighting source uh, for his machine. So that's why you, where's the light? Where's the light? There's no light right now on this machine. So, all right. Well, Chris, thanks for sending this in. Uh, at some points as I was going through the motor and that, I was not thanking you. I was more like, rah, 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 rah. but you know what? It's all part of the process. And every single vintage machine deserves a second chance. Don't you agree? All right, well, stay tuned for other great premieres, impromptu or otherwise like this. And remember, you're never old until regrets take the place of your dreams. Don't let that happen. Hang on to those dreams and don't wish upon a star. Take action on those dreams, right? Kind of like Walt Disney used to say. Remember I talked about him in one of the recent premieres? Showtime. Take care, folks.